Okay, well, this is just going to be another brief one on the subject of Joe Strummer. And uh, really, just what a piece of shit he was. And, um, well, this probably will annoy, you know, uh, many of his legion of kind of box set sniffer brigade kind of fanboys. And, I mean, you can go on any YouTube video, you know, after this, if you're that bored. Like, you just go Google Joe Strummer and just read through some of the comments underneath. They really think he's the second coming. They're all like, oh, we miss you, Joe. Oh. We need you now more than ever. Like he's this this wonderful sort of you know faultless kind of man. Um, well, I think reading between the lines in these books, not even reading between the lines. I mean, just just really <laughs> reading about him, he was a piece of shit, and uh, he would always be trying it on with his mates' girlfriends, in some instances wives, and I mean I don't know what else you can call a man who does that, but a piece of shit, and I mean. Oh, this is the 70s and I suppose people will say oh well, it was just the boomers well not really like I mean that, that, that's a level of like character flaw that I think objectively you kind of have to call out and say you're a piece of shit if you do that and yeah he did it all the time like he also um, he was age 27 and he took he took in with this girl who you know to quote the Beatles, she had just 17. She, she had just turned 17 and um, she was retaking her O-levels. And I mean, that's a bit borderline, isn't it? A 27-year-old guy with a 17-year-old. I mean, that's that's wrong in my view. I mean, okay, it's not technically nonsing. And I don't think he was a nonce. I'm not, you know, suggesting that. But it just does show you a lack of kind of just standards. And so he took this 17-year-old girl as well. And, uh, you know, she was obviously kind of, you know, sort of enthralled to him. Sort of a bit of a pop star at the time or whatever. And he took her off to live in some squat, grotty squats, you know what I mean? It's just like a 17-year-old girl in these fucking places. Now, okay, you know, some people say that's just rock and roll or whatever. Well, maybe. But, um, I mean, we'll just have a little read through some of these passages. I mean, there's a passage, um, I can't locate it, but he basically... he. he he took Don Letts' girlfriend off him. Don Letts is deeply... Like he's one of... The, I don't know with Don Letts. He's a guy that just seems so wildly kind of over-celebrated for such minimal talent. But anyway, I mean, he's his pal, you know, his good pal. And he sort of turns up for some party with his girl on the back of this motorcycle and, and Strummer's just trying to get into her all night. And it's his girlfriend, like, you know what I mean? And this is when they're like, Strummer's probably about 28 or something. I mean, he cheated on his women all all throughout his life, apparently. Which, you know, I don't know, depending on how... I mean, some people would say, well, he was a rock star. Well, he was kind of supposed to not be a rock star on one side. You know, he's a hypocrite in that sense. I just think you're a piece of shit if you cheat on your woman, to be brutally honest with you. I don't think there's anything more to it than that. Um, especially, you know, he cheated on, the, on his, you know, the, the mother of his children, you know, all the time. And he, he didn't... He didn't even hide it, you know, he was just a, I don't know, it was just quite an unpleasant bloke to me, reading, reading about it. Anyway, he took Don Letts' missus off him, and Don Letts was sore about it, said he didn't speak to him for like six months after. Well, I should fucking hope not, like, you know what I mean? If you go to a party with your girlfriend, your pretty girlfriend, apparently she was, and then, you know, Strummer's trying to get in with her, and he didn't just get in with her on the night, he then sort of, you know, he was kind of like sniffing around later, you know, the, the, the subsequent weeks. You know, and kind of took her off him. I mean, that's just it's just creepy, isn't it? It's creepy. It's, that's just wrong. I don't know. Anyway, um, yeah, and then there's this quote here. This is, uh, so this is later. This is around about 1985. And this is Paul Simonon's wife, right, <laughs> that he's trying to get into. And I'll just read the quote. On the morning after the show, on the 11th of September, oh, interesting day, in Genoa, Paul Simonon phoned Pearl Harbor. <laughs> got 11th of September. Not, I'm not reading anything into that. I'm, I'm laughing at it, to be clear. I'm not that mental. Uh, Pearl Harbor, his wife. Paul says, last night we all got drunk, and Joe and Cosmo told me that I had to divorce you or quit the band. I said, just come on home. I was furious with Joe. Joe used to hit on me all the time, put his hand on my leg and try it on all the time. Joe, cut it out. 
I got drunk and met them at Heathrow Airport. I was mad because I was always saw people ass kissing the clash. No one ever stood up for their rights like they told you to do. First person I see coming off the plane is good old Joe. He says, Pearl Harbor, hello, gorgeous. I say, hey, Joe, can, I came to ask you something. Is it true or is it not true that you asked Paul to either leave the clash or leave me? He admitted it. I went, fuck you, and threw my drink on him. Started punching and kicking him with my cowboy boots on the shins. He didn't retaliate. I said to Paul, leave me alone. Don't even bother trying to speak to me. Cosmo came up and uh, I said, you made a big mistake. Who the fuck do you think you guys are? The cops came and this woman was grabbing me off Cosmo and Joe, and she was laughing. Thought it was hilarious that this loudmouth American was kicking these guys. She said, you have to conti continue your fight outside. We don't allow this kind of behavior in this country. We went outside and Joe and Cosmo stood up, stood with us to get a taxi. I was saying, you think you're rock and roll? You think it's not rock and roll for me? I mean, it just goes on. I mean, she just kind of has a bit of a meltdown on him, basically. But what a fucking creep. Like He's trying, constantly trying to get into the fucking, you know, get into the drawers of his his, you know, support his bandmate and his alleged best friend or one of his best friend's wife. I mean, this guy really is a bit of a fucking rat, to be honest. Um, well, it does go on. The next day, Joe came to our house and showed me his legs, which were covered in scabs. I said, Pearl Harbor, I love you. You're the greatest. You're the smartest. I want to take you out. We went out drinking to all the bars. This is like his fucking friend's wife that he's always trying to get in with, who he's just instructed his friend to leave or leave the band. We went out drinking to all the bars. Joe showed everyone his scars and said, Pearl Harbor beat me up. He took off my high heeled shoes and poured champagne in them and drank it. I mean, that's just fucking weird. Like, he's just a weird cuck kind of bloke, I think. But yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Is this interesting or not? It's just, I think it's just showing you that the guy was a piece of shit. And I mean, you can read through these books. This is a pattern. So any of his like you know legions of like parasocial bros, who kind of think that he's like this angel, you know I I don't know what they're fucking thinking to be honest, but it's uh, it's clearly not the case. Now there is there is another uh, point I will go to as well here. Um, I'll have to find it. So one moment. Yeah, and this is another thing. Like he moved into this guy Sebastian Conran's house. Now Sebastian Conran was another exceptionally wealthy kind of public schoolboy. I think his father was a designer. I think it's Terence or Jasper Conran, someone like that. Not got that information here. But anyway, this this Sebastian character, who apparently he was also kind of like involved in the sort of like far left in the 1970s. But he had this uh, this wonderful house, which I'll, I'll put on the screen. It's 31 Albany Street, Regents Park. And I mean, this is like it's like a it's like a mansion in Regents Park. I mean, this is about as kind of like uh, you know. Really, really, like, wonderful property. I'll just read about it here. 31 Albany Street, the huge property had its main entrance, hardly ever used directly on the carriageway that ran around the park. The occupants of this luxury abode, among them Henry Bowles, a friend of Sebastian's who became close friends with Joe, overcame their ideological conflict by pretending it was a squat. On occasions, Joe actually claimed that it was, and treating it with utter disrespect. Uh, and I mean, it goes on. There's a number of other sort of anecdotes about this this place, and it's just this wonderful property. And he treated it like absolute shit, you know, sort of like pissed out the window and stuff, like pissed in bottles. And I, I mean, a lot of people was just think, ah, oh, this is just standard, like you know, rocker kind of lifestyle. But I don't know. I just find it particularly unedifying. He's just, uh, he's just a piece of shit. He trashed like his it, this guy's house basically which was this luxury house, and he fucking trashed it and, like, you know, treated it like a squat, which, I mean, you know, he shouldn't... Like, he says he treated it like like a squat. Well, a squat is not your fucking property. So, like, Strummer was really into this squatting stuff, which is when they just break into someone else's property and treat it like shit, basically, and trash the place and bring in loads of scumbags and they'd all fucking take drugs and, like, you know, piss in buckets and stuff. I mean, it's revolting. It's revolting, like you know. Uh, there's, there's nothing. I don't know. Maybe this, maybe this sounds too judgmental or something. I don't know. I just think it's nothing that should be celebrated. <laughs> I really don't. And to reiterate, this is a guy who just stole women from his friends, 
like pathologically throughout his life you know that that's a piece of shit I think in anyone's book and if it's not a piece of shit in your book then your morals are completely fucking you know flawed there you go I don't know if that's worth it but take it or leave it <laughs>